Part sixteen of Confessions of Two Brothers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Confessions of Two Brothers by John Cooper Powis and Llewellyn Powis. Confessions by Llewellyn, Section five. Venice. After this hemorrhage, I gradually began to get better. At last I was able to go out again, to look down at the little white buttressed church in the valley, and see the peasants come and go from its gates like tiny ants. I knew they went there to worship God, but I did not know whether they were wise or not. I made a scratch on the plastered wall of a chalet, and used to look at it and wonder if I should ever see it again after I got back to England, this tiny scratch on this particular spot of the material universe. At last I was released and rushed back to England. It was May Day when my brother and I looked out of the hotel windows at Folkestone. How familiar, how delicious, how green everything looked. I could almost see the birds' nests in the hedges. I could almost smell the young elder leaves as we were whirled up to London. My illness had sharpened my wits. At night, when I looked at the stars, I understood the background which belonged to our planet, poised and sailing from mystery to mystery, from abyss to abyss. I liked the idea of the blank, flaring spaces of infinity giving birth unwittingly to crafty intellectual eyes which peered out upon their secret astral chambers. The planet itself was sailing on to extinction, either by some catastrophic celestial collision, or by slow, senseless withering, and each man, each woman, and each child was destined also, sooner or later, to wear white stockings and be carried away to the churchyard. When I sat in church and heard my father speak so certainly of a future life, this was the life I envisaged. While the lamp light changed to a richer colour, the yellow ham hill stone of the chancel arch and the foolish village people grew restless for their suppers, and the boys and girls lolled in their seats and sighed for one another. I was a whole year at home, then all of a sudden I found myself emerged in a great wave of apathy. I have never been able to explain the cause of this. Was it, as my brother put it, that the iron of consumption was at last entering my soul, or that my enforced inaction was dulling my capacity for pleasure? Who can tell? Who knows where these great clouds come from, these clouds which come sailing out of eternity and settle sometimes so heavily on the heads of the sons of men? When, as I sit writing now, with the scoratic escarpments of Africa around me, I recall those days, and it seems perfectly incredible that any sadness of the kind could have overtaken me. Free as I was to wander over the station fields, with brown hairs circling through the gleaming wind-blown spring grass, with more hens dabbling in the water, and with the noblest of women by my side. But so it was. When I went out in the early mornings, I no longer wanted to smell the ground ivy, to smell the very earth itself. My imagination seemed suddenly drugged, my senses seemed to have lost their finer edge, and the dead weight of the commonplace dragged me down and filled my spirit with lamentable misgivings. I wrote to my brother in a curiously peevish tone. I accused him of deserting me. I told him he had forgotten the roads, the lanes, the wayside trees, the field ponds we had so often visited together. I told him I believed it was now of no consequence to him that the purple lilacs were already out by the side of the Foss Way, and casting spiral shadows on the white May dust. He came to see me at once, and suggested, as we sat in the corner of the potato garden, that I should go with him to Venice. It was arranged. Before I started, I went down to the terrace walk and picked for a buttonhole, one of those spotted Turk's head lilies which possess such a deadly and voluptuous and heavy perfume. It was symbolic. It was what Oscar Wilde would have done, and that was why I did it. We crossed the channel in halcyon weather, 
we reached Venice the next day. Venice! I don't think any human apathy could oppress me for long in that city. Day followed day, and I walked those marble piazzas in a kind of trance. We climbed to the top of the Champenal and looked down on the apostolic crocodile and upon the lion. We went over the glass factory, saw the workmen twist the heated crystal into a thousand exquisite shapes. We crossed to Torsilio and wandered about the marshland behind. We visited the island cemetery and loitered down along the long cypress alleys, tapping at the marble walls, each one honeycombed with the dead. At night we glided through the city in a gondola, while ever and again out of the lapping waters rose unmistakable the smells of old, long-forgotten centuries. Sometimes we would wander into St. Mark's, and on one occasion, I remember, we saw an old man shuffle up to the great pagan font, and dip his fingers into the holy water, and make the sign upon his forehead, and upon the forehead of a child who was holding to him. We watched him there in the shadowy west end of an ancient church, while all the time, far up above the altar, the gilded angels sang hallelujahs to their creator, to the creator of Venice, to the creator of the world. The most trivial things seen during those days seem indelibly imprinted upon my mind. I have forgotten nothing. I recall exactly the direct momentary glance of an elaborately dressed cosmopolitan harlot, so steely and ice-cold that it seemed to penetrate to my very soul as I prowled one evening up and down the brilliantly lighted colonnade. I remember also the look of a girl eating a handful of red currants in a shady and insanitary side street. I remember the June roses in the gardens on the Lido, and the extraordinary knotted skin, spiral-shaped seahorses, so miniature yet so perfect in design, which used to die by the hundreds amongst the fishes dragged in from the Adriatic. But all the time I was conscious of my sickness. It was always at the back of my mind. I could never dismiss it. I had a relapse on my way home, and was laid up at Milan for weeks. For a whole year afterwards my health was uncertain. In desperation I decided to exile myself out of here in this abandoned and sun-seared continent. To be alive in Africa is better than to be dead in Europe. We are still on the same planet, writes J.C.P. But that is about all that can be said. I left England a month after war had been declared. End of part 16